Hello, everyone. Welcome to Looking to the East. It's a pleasure to be on the air again with uh, my friend and uh, uh, an expert on Japan, Mike Matsuno. So, Mike, welcome to the show. Once again, you're a repeat customer. Thanks really for having appreciate me. that. <laughs> uh, to Mike, be back. Um, yeah, Mike has uh, a video broadcast, a uh, webcast that he does periodically focusing on Japan. It's called uh, Man in Japan, right? Is that the correct name, Mike? Yeah, the YouTube channel, yeah. correct. Yeah, so uh, he graciously has agreed to be with us this morning. He was able to escape from his normal work uh, this morning, so I do appreciate that. No, uh, we're going to be talking about tourism. We did that a couple of weeks ago with Eric Johnson of the Japan Times, but I wanted to get Mike on the show because Mike, as I mentioned, is featuring... <laughs> Uh, some of the interesting characteristics and things to do, places to go in Japan. So this is maybe a little bit more practical approach to the fact that Japan has opened up to tourists now, <clears throat> starting from actually last month. So Mike, before we get into this, I do want to show our viewers uh, the work that you do. So Eric, if you could bring up the uh, web page, the YouTube web page for Mike, and we can show everyone what that looks like. And uh, the variety of different things. Yeah, the last few videos, I, I I concentrated mainly on the opening of up of Japan because there seemed to be the most interest there. So, the last part was until the actual opening, and since then, I haven't done um, a video because there hasn't been that much going on. We're we're still kind of a wait and see to see how things are going. But as you know, you know, as you had mentioned earlier, that you know, over what five about five hundred thousand uh, foreign tourists came in in the last month in. October. So things yeah, are. And then, sorry to interrupt, but that's actually the uh, opening day was October 11th. So it wasn't actually for the full month. Right. So people probably were uh, buying tickets, maybe expecting things to open up because that's a huge number just in the last three weeks of the month. Yeah, it was really surprising in a way. And, um, you know, people jumped on it. You know, every, there are so many people who were just waiting. It was really interesting to see that whole fever of, you know, Japan opening up. And that's why those videos, you know, a lot of people watch because people were just seemed to be waiting. And uh, once it opened, you know, like you said, some people either had planned on it or had bought tickets right away because they wanted to come in early when they thought that, you know, there's still very few uh, foreign tourists, you know, which it was was true and still mm -hmm. is. There's, you know, there are there are more people coming in, but it's still such a small amount compared back to 2019. <laughs> Yeah, I saw the statistics for October. It was uh, over 2,000% compared to October the previous year, but it was still way down when we were averaging. Well, in 2019, it was up 32 31 million. million I think. Yeah, 31 yeah, to 32 so million. So averaging two and a half to three million per month as Japan was ramping up the tourism. And Abe was very supportive. That was a prime yeah. minister at the time and was hoping that for the Olympics there'd be 40 million. But uh, the, the government's still setting the goal for having 60 million tourists, uh, I saw in 2030. So they're hoping that this uh, initial uh, bump, uh, this, these initial uh, surprising numbers will continue. And <clears throat> the expectation is that for this month, which is coming to a close fairly soon, a couple of days, um, will be over 1 million visitors. Anecdotally, too, since uh, I, we live in the Kansai area here, uh, my friends in Kyoto are, are saying, wow, they're back. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Kyoto is filled now. There's more foreigners than there yeah. are Japanese, which has not been the case for the last couple of years. And uh, people are having uh, difficulty getting flights into the country, especially from Southeast Asia. That seems to be the primary yeah. source of the bump in tourism is Correct. Singapore, yeah. rich Singaporeans and rich Koreans. Koreans, yes. Yeah, and others, uh, Thais as well, are coming in. So it's, it's exciting for me uh, since uh, I focus on tourism and uh, we have a tourism school at Kansai Gaida University. So I'm, I'm glad to see that. It's interesting because, you know, it's like, you know, I'm, you know, being from Hawaii too, I understand that whole thing about the tourists that, you know, people want the tourist dollars, but they don't necessarily want too many tourists around. And and, and that's the whole <laughs> irony that goes through, even with Kyoto, right? I was just visiting um, uh, uh, Airbnb yesterday and I was talking to the gentleman and of course, you know, um, he has an exclusive villa in um 
Kyoto in Takeda, in the Takeda area. So I went to see because my sister folks are coming next April and I wanted to make sure that it was fine. And it's a beautiful villa. But I asked him about, you know, and of course he was happy that the foreign tourists are coming back. You know, however, you know, I was telling him, you know, people are you know nobody none of the locals were actually who are not in tourists were that excited about it right because oh, really? <laughs> yeah because of the crowds and everything however you know they they need the you know kyoto needs the the revenue so it's kind of mm -hmm. a you know, where's that balancing point, right? You know, the optimal level of tourism. And I'm sure you talk about it in your classes. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm on a, the, the tourism committee. Actually, I'm the chair of the tourism committee for the ACCJ. And uh, maybe I'll get these guys on the show. Uh, they're two uh, uh, whole, I don't, I don't know where they're originally from, maybe the mainland. But anyway, they did work in Hawaii. <laughs> on digitally monitoring tourism. So Mike, I don't know if you've been to Di Diamond Head recently, no. but they have an electronic entry system now. Oh, really? How yeah, interesting. So, and they, yeah, so they control the crowds. You know, Diamond Head, uh, I, when I'm visiting Hawaii, I, I try and go there, not just for the exercise, just to right. do the climb and so forth. Right, right. And sometimes it was just so uncomfortable. Be, uh -huh. And, you know, people, there's a lot of people who shouldn't be going up those. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so, Slow and, the but, traffic down, yep. Yeah, so, but now through this uh, this digital system, you have to apply in advance, and there's also a fee. So they're making this, the, uh, whoever owns Diamond Head, maybe it's the state, is making millions of dollars there. So maybe at some point, Japan will, like Kyomizadera, you'll have to register in advance before you go there, or Arashiyama during the, the, the fall changing of the lease. So it'll be interesting to see how Kyoto perhaps begins to think about how to manage the crowd so they don't have the problem with the local people being so upset because yeah. you're exactly right in 2019 some of my friends in kyoto wouldn't even go out out of their apartment yeah yeah they were just they were just overwhelmed yeah it's but interesting anyway, be oh, go, oh, go ahead go ahead yeah go ahead man. it's interesting because as you said the corona kind of spoiled people here and even for myself you know when i went to buy a shinkansen ticket if i was going to tokyo or i was going to fukuoka you just walk into the you know the midori guchi the you know the shinkansen uh, per ticket purchasing area you know maybe it's two people in front of you so it's just like and then you you forgot how it was and then just last week when i was going down to um to onomichi in hiroshima i you know i went in and the line was like 25 people long you know and of course there are wow. foreigners in the line also and i was making a short video i never put it up yet but i was gonna i was gonna say is that you know plan ahead if you're coming to japan make sure that you try to buy your tickets on a weekday and not on a friday saturday or sunday because it's it's wow. really a long line and just be prepared if you have foreigners in front of you nothing against foreigners because i'm a foreigner but it's going to take them probably three times longer than the japanese in purchasing so you just have to kind of right. calculate your time but yes you know it's 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 very much it's different now so i'm sure the the locals are starting to you know, like you said, when when it was full on, 60 million tourists, I, I don't know how they're going to really manage that, like in Kyoto. And I think that's why the idea is to try and spread them out to, you know, other areas, especially there's a lot of areas mm -hmm. that are depressed that that want the tourists. But, you know, people mm -hmm. mainly do the Silk Road, the Silk Route, right? The Silk Road mm -hmm. route, you know, like Tokyo, mm -hmm. Osaka, Kyoto, Nara, sometimes Hiroshima. So yeah. those those are heavily, you know, visited. There was an article, I don't know if you saw it, in New York Times yesterday about alternative travel in Hawaii. I'll no, send it no. to you. Yeah, but please. It was, it's a New York Times writer. And um, rather than go to Waikiki and hang out on, on the beach there where everyone goes, basically, um, she uh, created a, an alternative kind of sustainable yeah. travel path. So she was in remote areas and so forth. And it was actually quite an interesting write-up. So that may be something that uh, will be applied in Japan, especially for the visitors who have come here, maybe for their second or third or fourth time. It sounds but like e ecotourism. Were they doing some kind of ecotourism? Was exactly, that... yeah. Okay, okay. Ecotourism in kind of remote areas that are not so heavily touristed. And also, uh, just for the Hawaiians here, um, it was uh, facilitating or trying to encourage usage of native Hawaiian okay. uh, companies and so forth. So that element was included as well, because uh, in the article, uh, it pointed out that the state of Hawaii picked uh, 
an alternative tourism organization to promote Hawaii that is more mm. native Hawaiian based than the, the traditional Hawaii uh, Tourist Bureau. And, and now they're doing both the article mentioned. But anyway, <clears throat> we're getting a little bit off track here, Mike, because okay, I wanted ahead. to talk with you about the, the things that you've highlighted uh, over the last uh, year or plus that you've been running your webcast, things that you would uh, recommend to our viewers uh, if they do want to come to Japan. You know, I guess we're trying to encourage more people to come to Japan, <laughs> despite the issues that we just talked about, uh, overcrowding and so forth. Well, you know, you know, I think you saw on, it was that summit forum in the summer that Japan was selected as the number one destination in the world. Yes. And so Japan has gotten a lot of good PR. And, you know, Japan really is still, you know, I, I'm a little bit biased, but I think no matter where you go in the world, you'll never get as good service as you get here. You know, kind people, very helpful people, and the, the yen being down and just and safe, you know, like, you know, it's, this is, I believe it's the safest country in the world per capita for that many people of 127 million people. So you got yeah. to kind of, you got, you got a, in a kind of an exotic destination for many people. Um, you got safety, you got great food, you got kind people and all of that. So I still think it's a huge, it's a great destination to come to. Now, what I would suggest is that right now, you know, with, with the, just in you know, the last couple of days, there's a, a lot of problems going on in China. So, you know, what before back in 2019, 37% were Chinese tourists and, and they made up a huge bulk. So right mm -hmm. now, I don't see the Chinese coming to Japan for the foreseeable, right. maybe the next year at the, probably another year at least, which means that you've taken 37% of the foreign tourists out, which means it's still very viable now to, to come in and to to visit places. It's not that crowded. Mm -hmm. Yes, you know, <laughs> Kiyomizu Temple will always be crowded and the mm -hmm. main sites, but it's, it's still a really good time to come. I would suggest coming, you know, now December, January is a bit cold, but if you're interested in like coming for, you know, for skiing or snowing, Hokkaido or maybe Nagano, but from April, I see a lot of people coming. And when we say a lot, it's not, it's still very small compared to the 2019 level. So yes, mm -hmm. I would say in the next year, I would suggest that if you're thinking about Japan, it's a great time to come because you've, mm -hmm. the Chinese uh, tourists still will not be coming in as well as people are still, you know, it's still ramping up. So, mm -hmm. you know, March, end of March, April, great time to come. Mm. Yeah. You're, um, you're, notice about uh march april of course that, that corresponds with uh, cherry blossom season right. which is just magical in this country it, i really i've been here for so many years i know you have mike but every uh, cherry blossom season I, i'm still just in awe i'm amazed at how wonderful that is and the the feeling you get and how it changes the mood of the japanese people themselves right right yeah so, so it's just an incredible time to visit and that corresponds with um uh, Victor Asuno, who's the head of Delta Airlines, he he joined the, the tourism committee meeting a few weeks ago, and he was talking about how they're expecting their business to pick up. He also said uh, the late first quarter is when he expects his planes to be full. So uh, they'll be coming, uh, tourists That'll will be, be March, coming April, in. Right? Yeah. March, April, right? Yeah. March, April, yeah. He said that uh, the timing for the opening in October kind of caught them flat-footed. Also, the hotels yeah. are saying this as well, and right. they couldn't really properly prepare. Uh, for the uh, the New Year's season, yeah, I, yeah, but they're getting ramped up now for the spring season for sure. Yeah, I'm sure everyone was caught off guard at that October 10th or you know when when they started um, yeah. that announcement just because. I thought too it was going to be end of the year or earlier, probably January, February. I was thinking, you know, in, just in time for the cherry blossom season, but I think it was because of the weakening yen, because the yen was dropping so fast, and that they they had to do something to that. Suddenly, you know, Kishida, Prime Minister Kishida, two weeks before he makes an announcement, and two weeks later he changes that announcement. So it was like that mm. quick. So I, you know, in Japan things move slow. I always think really almost too slow for me. However, mm -hmm. when there's a need, things can happen quickly. So it's just a matter of needs versus, you know, following the normal protocol. Yeah, I, uh, <clears throat> that's my impression of Japan as well, that things move very slowly. But then when finally it comes to the point where a decision has to be made, 
or needs yeah. to be made, then it happens really quickly yeah. and uh, catches catches you by surprise. That's why I think a lot so, of people weren't ready and they're still hiring. I mean, there's several articles you can read uh, you know, online that talks about how a lot of the places are still 50% understaffed. And, oh, you know, yeah. and, and so a lot of places that you may have visited before maybe are closed or so the restaurant's not running. And those those stories, of course, are true. But I think as far as just service, like I just went down to uh, Onomichi Shimanani to, to cycle the Shimanani Kaido uh, route. Oh, yeah. That's and, a, and, can you describe that, Mike, for the people who don't know? Oh, this is the one Shimanani, of the wonderful experiences. Yes. CNN calls it like one of the most stunning um, bike routes in the world, you know, and some people say it's the most beautiful coastal scenic area of Japan. And um, I thought I had to do it. It's a 75 kilometer, about 43, 44 mile ride. And, um, you know, even though I'm getting much older, I decided I had to try it just to, to see, you know, and but it was really tough. And so I'm working on a video now to kind of explain to people what they should know before they go, because there's no video about that you know people just think oh you know you watch those videos and you go like oh i can do that it's not that mm -hmm. far right and then you see you know it's six side it connects six islands by six huge massive suspension bridges one of them being the largest in the entire world mm -hmm. and when you're riding over those bridges and seeing the coastal sea scenery it's like it's yeah it's magnificent you know mm -hmm. you know <laughs> as long as the weather is pretty good because if it's raining it's a little bit more difficult to see everything but yeah but anyway, I did that, and I and I think you know, like um, what I've seen is that the the service is still there. Uh, everyone's still, you know, you know, high Japanese level of service. Like I always think, Japanese service is the best in the world. You cannot oh, yeah. even compare. You know, I mean, every right. time I leave Japan, I always feel disappointed, no matter where <laughs> I go. You know, because you start to yep. get you, you get you expect right, like the minimum. And think about it, the minimal service. I mean, I'm sorry, the maximum, the best service in the world. And you don't even have to tip, right? I just saw a news clip on the new NHK just yesterday that said now in like New York, they're asking for people to tip if you went in, go into retail or you you go to a car, you know, it, it's like it's going the opposite way in America where well, they're, 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 yeah, retail, they're asking like for, for you know, wow. they have on, on the credit card automatically comes up. Do you want to oh. tip and things like, and I'm going like, wow. yeah, it's, it's okay. like, it's gotten, yeah. So you get, not so great service in the United States, not every place, but not so great service. And yeah. you still have to tip. When Japan, you get the best service in the world and you don't tip. Yeah. I, I also go, well, why isn't that the model for the world, right? You know, like why why, why is yeah. there this constant thing like, you know, getting something, I don't say for nothing, but still it's, it's, it's completely different. But anyway, right. the service in Japan is still really high, still really good. There, mm -hmm. But there might be places that you had visited before that, maybe has closed or some places that, you know, um, are just not there like when before when you, if you had come before. Right. Yeah. That, that's interesting. You know, I've, I've I attempted to tip a couple of times here because the service was so good. And then the, the, like the taxi cab driver or the restaurant owner will say no. Yeah. It won't yeah. let you even do it. It's so deeply embedded in Japanese culture that that's just not something that, uh, you do it all. So a remarkable difference in culture between Japan and uh, the United States when it comes to that particular activity. Yeah, it's all about expectations, right? What you expect, right? I mean, in Japan, they just expect that you give you want to give the best service and that's your job, right? You know, it's yeah. not about getting a tip or maybe, you know. So, yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. That's one of the real not so good feelings I have when I when I leave Japan, especially if I go to the United States about the tipping thing. You know, in restaurants and things are different, but yeah. outside of that, you know, where everybody wants, you know, Subway, you know, tip jar or this or that, you know, <laughs> sorry, you know. Yeah, the other thing is safety too. I have to remind myself when I go back to the United States, go, go back home basically that uh, I, I can't leave my bag for a second. So, yeah, I, mean, that's, yeah. I mean, it's not something I would recommend. If you do visit Japan, you should right, keep an right. eye on your things because there is some crime here, but it's nothing like uh, in the United States. So yeah, you know, I consciously, I, I, I don't know if you do this too. I get on the plane, I'm going, I'm going to US now. I'm going to US yeah. now. I can't behave like I do yeah. when I'm living here in Japan. <laughs> For me, the radar goes up. The ra you know, Hawaii is not so bad, but still, the radar has to go up. You know, I yeah, mean, exactly. in Japan, it's almost that you get you almost take it for granted too much and you have still have to be careful like you know people leave their iphone on at starbucks to hold a seat they just leave it on the on the, the counter or the table you know or, right. or even their computer right. or i go to the gym here you know and the lockers are all open 
and you see their keys and their wallet. I even took pictures of that. I was supposed to make a video about that too. I, I've been like, you know, motorcycle. I, I, I'm at the gym and the motorcycle is there with his helmet just sitting on the seat. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, you, right. you know, it's like nothing's locked down or anything. And it's like, yep. you almost get, you know, you get too comfortable. But yes, when I go to the United States, especially the radar goes up and you're always kind of, I don't want to say paranoid, but it's, you, you, you have to take a, like, you have to have street sense when you're moving about, you know. Um, but that's what I, I love about Japan, though, where I think I think number one thing in any country should be safety, right? That mm -hmm. that you don't have to worry about your things or you know where you know where you leave it or right. you know that people are basically honest. Yes, there's crime. Yes, there's murders, and yes, you know you still have to be careful, and you gotta you know. But still, it's it's unbelievable. It, yeah. So I, you and I have lived in Japan a long time, and we're both still amazed at that. I guess coming from the United States, yeah, <laughs> we're kids. Our expectations were spent said high, but we're we're. I wanted to talk about Hawaiians. Now, okay. You're Hawaiian born, okay, right? And right. Uh, I have many Hawaiian friends uh, through uh, my time at the University of Hawaii, and I've noticed that Hawaiians. More than, I mean, everybody loves Japan. Yeah. Like yeah. you mentioned, Kyoto's number one, Japan's yeah. number one. But Hawaiians love Japan the most, it seems like to me. So I have two friends that have already come here. And they've come once. And like I told you before we started the show, they're coming again, yeah. you know, within two or three months. So right. what is this connection between Hawaii and Japan? I mean, I obviously, there's many Japanese right. descent, people descent in Hawaii. But I, it's it's beyond that, I think. Yeah, it's it's a strong, strong affinity. It's it's like a it's it's a it's a it's a mutually love relationship between the Japanese love Hawaii and the people from Hawaii love Japan. And I think it, it's it's several different aspects. But I think one, you know, it Hawaii is an Asian state, so about sixty seven percent are of some you know Asian background, Asian you know Japanese American, Japanese Chinese. There's an Asian mm -hmm. connection, I think. So mm -hmm. excuse me, excuse, but there's also um. You know, so Japanese Americans also have this connection, mm -hmm. but I think it has to do with just the, first we talked about the service and people just being so nice and they mm -hmm. love the shopping and of course the food. For example, Hawaii people love Las Vegas, right? They always call it the Ninth Island, right? I mean, that's mm -hmm. like the number you know for for most people the number one destination. Mm -hmm. However, what I found out, especially with my relatives, is you know, maybe they've been going to Las Vegas three times a year for the last 10 years. Then they'll go once to Japan for the first time and it changes their whole mind and they want to go to Japan. It even can override Las Vegas to a certain degree because wow. I think they're just yeah. fascinated by things being, okay, things are different, exotic, new, it's safe. Yeah. Um, people are just nice, you know, yeah, and you don't right. have to worry, you know, I mean, just people at the service. I mean, you really can't beat the surface, right? Just think hey, about Mike, it. You know, MGM's working on opening up an integrated resort in Osaka. Oh, so really? once that happens, then maybe the Hawaiians going to Las Vegas will go down even more yeah. for those that are motivated yeah. by gambling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you could get, you know, to, to kill two birds with one stone, right? Get gambling <laughs> yeah. And, and Japan. Yeah, that would be ideal. But so, you know, all of that. And I think a lot of, um, before, when I first came to Japan, you know, when I came back over, what, 35, 30 years, 35 years ago, Hawaii people were not traveling to Japan very much. It was still considered oh, really? far exotic. Yes. It's okay. only been in the last maybe 10, 15, 20 years when, you know, flights became more common. Uh, Japan, you know, maybe thanks to... Um, Kiku television in Hawaii and, you know, people watching more Japanese on the on the television that they feel more, you know, closer. But all they have to do is come one time and then they're hooked, you know, mm -hmm. and then they go, come back and they tell their friends, hey, you got to go to Japan. Originally, it used to be all group tours mainly, you know, like, yeah. you know, they, they used to come and everybody was coming on a group tour. This is back yeah. maybe, what, 20 years. And yeah. from that, you have a different generation. You got SNS, you got the internet now, right? When we first yeah. came, there was no internet. So you had to do it by yourself. But now you got internet, you can make your reservation on what, booking.com or, or whatever you use. Yeah. It's it's now it's so easy to come, you know, and it's closer and, and, and faster coming to Japan from Hawaii than going to the East Coast. Right. You know, and you yeah, don't yeah. have to change a plane if you have a direct flight. Right. So it's like, right. like, like, why, why wouldn't you come right if, to Japan? So you can get everything, the full package, you know, something unique, different, good food, safe place, learn something, nice people. 
What more yeah. could you ask for, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, my friend Arlene, she's the one who, who came in November and is coming again in January. In in her neighborhood, uh, she goes and walks with the neighbors. It's kind of like a, a routine, I, yeah. maybe very Hawaiian kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. And what do they talk about? Japan. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the next time they're going, I mean, all of them. <laughs> it's just yeah, incredible. You, you know what? I used to go back. I used to go back and take care of my parents when they were, you know, getting older and things for the last mm. like 10 years. And <laughs> Every time I would go back, no matter who I would talk to, you know, CNAs, you know, many of them were from the Philippines or so anyone. Everybody loved Japan, and every and many most people had a Japan story. You know, just mm -hmm. like you're from, being from Hawaii, you travel to the mainland, and then you meet somebody for the first time. And if they've been to Hawaii, a lot of people have a Hawaii story. They want to share because they had a good time in Hawaii. Well, Hawaii people have it's the reverse; they have the Japan story about mm -hmm. you know, oh, they, they went here or they went there or they tried this, yeah. and and you know, because Hawaii being so small, everything spreads among you know, like my sister is coming in April, and she had this intense, intense itinerary for two weeks. Like everything oh, had wow. to be checked. So she's researching in advance yeah, where yeah, she wants yeah. to go. And it's not oh, only really? her, she got right. this from her friends who have like a intense, intense, like every single minute almost is wow. to the dime scheduled. And they're wow. sharing that among themselves. So it's yeah. spread and spread. That's why April, so many people are planning to come. Yeah. And so that's why I had to go and check out the Airbnb yesterday. My sister sent me an assignment that it had to be perfect. You know, you're there for one <laughs> week. Yeah, you need to see this place. So uh, we're running out of time, Mike, but maybe the last question I have, do you see... You know, we talked about, or you know, because we live here, the the more common places for general tourists to go. Uh, it, the Hawaiian lists that you're talking about, are they different? Uh, are they like more refined? Or are they going to places that normally tourists wouldn't go? Or maybe something relating perhaps to their ancestry uh, is on that list as well? I think people are still going to the to the regular places, the Tokyo, okay. Kyoto, because because there's still a, a lot to see, right? Like my sister, mm -hmm. this is probably her third time, but we're still gonna do Tokyo, and we're gonna do um, Kansai, right? But I think that. And of course, people, if they're from a certain area, like we went back to visit our family. I'm fourth generation, but in Hiroshima to, to, to visit the, the grave when my parents used to come. So there is that aspect. But I think people will start to venture out more and more, especially young people. And I suggest to them, yeah, to get off the Silk Road route, you know, whether mm -hmm. it's Hokuriku or Tohoku mm -hmm. or, you know, Saing, you know, you know, t you know, of course there is still, okay, there is the one challenge for some people is the language, you know, like everybody's mm -hmm. really nice and the service is great, but sometimes you might go out to an outline area and might be difficult to, to communicate and things, you know, you know, take your, t get, get your uh, pocket Wi-Fi or SIM card, make sure you have that and then have your translator program and you can use the, you know, you can translate, take that with you. But again, because it's safe, it may be inconvenient at times, but it's mm -hmm. part of the adventure, I think. So I would suggest to many people, if you've been, if you've done the Silk Road route, to go out to more like, you know, Tohoku, Saing, um, mm -hmm. the Kyushu, Shikoku. When I was in, when oh. I was riding the bike around Shikoku. Oh, it's that's, amazing, isn't it? Shikoku yeah. is fantastic. <laughs> it's like old traditional rural Japan. If you want to yeah. see how Japan was, the real Japan, quote unquote, you can go to Shikoku, maybe South Kyushu, you know. Yes, yeah. it might be difficult to get a, you know, not 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 many people speak English, but you got the translator, mm -hmm. take a risk, you know, and, you know, you book your accommodations on booking.com, you know the train schedule, you should be fine. And, you know, somebody usually is always there to help you. You know, people are just nice, right? Yeah. All right, Mike, we have run out of time. We could go okay. on easily for another half hour. I just... This country is just so magnificent in all aspects of it, not just the, the traditional places where tourists want to go, for example, Kyoto. When I was a student, I, I traveled all throughout the whole country, pretty much you know, on a shoestring. Uh, I had no bad experiences in every place I went, the volcanic areas, the beautiful lakes, the mountains, the rainforests, the deserts. My God, this country has it all. So if you get out from Osaka, Tokyo, yeah. and those areas, yeah. you're going to discover just some beautiful, fascinating yeah. places. That's been my experience. And, and I remember there's a Mr. Walsh when I first came to Japan. I was 23 years old. He was 65, and he was like my senpai in the in teaching English in the company. And he had told me, he said, Mike, Japan is is so 
diverse, even though it's a small country, you know, it's the size of California, right? He said, you could travel every weekend for the rest of your life and not see it all. And that's what he told me. And I did that same <laughs> as you when I was young. I used yeah. to go every chance I had, I was trying to see most of it. I think I've seen all of Japan, except maybe South Kyushu. I think I've seen the okay. majority. And hey, more of Shikoku, you, Mike, I like to see. South Kyushu is fantastic. Oh, really? <laughs> Hakushima and everything, right? Oh, beautiful. Just absolutely magnificent. So, yeah, I hope, uh, like you said, more people will go out and see these areas, you know, take Take the risk because, you know, people are, it's a safe country. That's the whole thing. You can take a risk and you mm -hmm. might be inconvenienced a bit with the language, but mm -hmm. with the internet and with, you know, you know, it's safe. Take the risk and go out and All see right. Japan. All right. We'll close on that. Thank you so much, Mike. This is, uh, no. I think we've done a, a good job, maybe creating more problems. <laughs> for, <laughs> for the locals, for right? <laughs> like cussing us out in the back, like, oh, yeah. yeah. Your... <laughs> and it sounds like you're preparing a bunch of uh, videos now having to do with tourism and some of your experiences. Yes, I'm going I'm, I'm to the, the ride. Yes, I'm going to switch more toward to tourist tourist um focus things and i'm going to do one about the, the what you should know before you cycle the shimanani kaido and i'm going to do another one about my experience of oh i had a lot of i mean a lot of mistakes you know i'm not i was naive going on there and so i hope people watch the videos before they go so they don't make the same mistakes about you should maybe get an e-bike versus a standard bike and oh, yeah. you know don't Big plan difference. to do the yeah don't plan to do the 75 kilometers unless you're a real advent cyclist or very young and tough so yeah. you know little things like that like you know when you watch All those right. videos on youtube you go like oh Oh, yeah, it looks fun. Oh, I could do that, right? And then right. when you get there, it's like, holy cow, this is something <laughs> totally different. I, I hit the first bridge coming up, and I knew. I, I just rode maybe 15 kilometers, struggled to get to the top of the first, basically pushed the last maybe 200 meters, oh. and then I said, I cannot do this. <laughs> I cannot, oh, and I, and I, and I, and I, I'm stuck. I started the trip, you know. But anyway, uh, it will be in the video about what, what eventually happened. Okay, yeah. So so for our viewers, uh, check out Man in Japan. Yeah, and, Man in uh, Japan. It's under my yeah, name, just, Mike Matsuno. Yeah, the Man in Japan. Go. Yeah, thanks, Eric, for putting that up again. <laughs> and uh, you, for those of you that are interested in food, I know you've done uh, – Shows on ramen and uh, yeah, various Yeah, I, I do uh, a lot Japanese... of like, yeah, YouTube shorts. I started to do YouTube shorts on food and travel. And then the, the, the regular long format was more on issues and more, more a little bit more deeper. But yeah, I want to okay. do more about food and um, travel for the YouTube shorts. It's only like a minute long. All right. Okay. Thank you so much, Mike. It's been a pleasure hosting you. Thank you. We really appreciate you sharing your experiences and your enthusiasm no. for this beautiful country that we live in. Well, thank um, you very much for inviting me. Thank you, Steve. Oh, you're very welcome. We'll be doing a show again in two weeks, uh, kind of a round table, uh, end of year discussion with my normal cast of characters. So please tune in for that. For now, this is Looking to the East. Thank you so much. And I guess in honor of Mike, I'll say aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.